Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Energy News Beat Daily Stand-Up. I'll tell you what, this is the weekly recap. It is Saturday, October 26th. I hope you have an absolutely wonderful weekend. Uh, buckle up. It has been crazy around the news desk. We've had everything from talking about bricks. We've had Bill over on Squawk Box uh, with his 32 reasons why he was not going to vote for Kamala, including banning the uh, LNG and uh, lots of other good reasons. So I'll tell you what, I hope everybody has been having a very nice calm before the storm. Go out and vote. Make sure that you do get your vote counted. Thank you very much. And like, subscribe, hug your pets, and pass this along. Thank you very much. Talk to you all soon. Electrifying everything means higher energy costs for consumers. These DOE numbers prove it again. Hey, I'll tell you what, Robert Bryce is a rock star, and uh, he this came off of his sub stack. I highly recommend, and oh, Michael, well, let's tell our listeners that uh, they need to subscribe to our sub stack. We are going to a paid model on it. So we love Substack, by the way. Hey, last year, Stacey Abrams, a prominent Democrat who served in Georgia House of Representatives for 10 years, joined Rewiring America as a senior counsel. Michael, are you ready? She was joining a dark money NGO because she wants to help promote electrify everything agenda. How much do you think went back to her her election campaign or back to her? She's one of many non-governmental organizations and politicians who contend they're trying to electrify everything. The White House claimed that electrifying everything would lower energy costs. One of the richest climate NGOs in the United States, Natural Resources Defense Council, annual revenue $193 million, claims if it's done right, electrifying will bring big benefits to environmental justice communities, including lowering costs. Except, Robert puts, it won't. Here's the charts. This is really pretty funny. The DOE equivalent of equivalent residual residential energy costs in 2024. Look at that number. Electricity is 47% more than just natural gas. You take a look at the BTU. The DOE says electricity will cost residential users about 47 million BTU this year and it cost around 13 million. Unbelievable. That's a lot of extra money that they're talking about. Yeah, it, it, it really is. I mean, the whole dark money thing is, is a little bit spooky and it happens on both sides so we can't it's it, not necessarily a partisan it, it's one of the few things that's not a partisan issue when it comes no. to money and politics i'd argue the democrats are probably worse at it than than the republicans at least elon's coming out and saying hey i'm the one donating 200 million dollars versus it, it kind of going in these roundabout ways i mean obviously absolutely what, what's going on with this ukraine stuff is you know, we'll just leave it at that. I don't want to. I don't want to venture into your territory, Stu. Oh no, this is for entertainment purposes only. <laughs> we don't want absolutely. Wanna... <laughs> but I mean, we all know that the, the the DOE is. You know, we covered that article a couple weeks ago about how the DOE is not wanting to release the cost per kilowatt. Yeah, a lot of come these stuff, on. Or, or a lot of these different sources. So it's it's or the, or the jobs market with the numbers being wrong. I mean, if they all go hand in hand. Yeah, I mean. You know, it, it, it only takes somebody with half a brain to realize that natural gas at this point is cheaper than solar. I know people will argue that solar is cheaper, but that's they're not. This is what oil and gas used to do. Well, it's really cheap once we drill the well to produce it. It's like, yeah, but how much did it cost to drill the well? Oh, it cost you a hundred million dollars to go get a million <laughs> MCF a day. Oh, OK. So I'm the idiot here. So I think a lot of people are factoring in a lot of the, the capex that goes into this stuff. You know, obviously, this electrify everything, it's got nothing to do with energy and, in my opinion, everything to do with power. They don't and like the fact that people who are for oil and gas vote Republican. So what can get oil and gas out of the picture? Oh, renewables. So we're going to support renewables. Has little to do with climate change. Even our friend of the show, John Kerry, it's not about climate change for him. It's about power. Uh, he, he He's a, never mind. The U.S., this one chart in here, Michael, 
Take a look at the U.S. produces more than Canada, China, Iran, Norway, and Qatar combined. The Permian Basin alone produces as much as Canada, 18 BCF per day. That is absolutely amazing. But Iran readies new oil outlet to bypass the Strait of Hormuz. And, and Michael, this is really, really important. Iran is closer to finding a way to circumvent the Strait of Hormuz when it comes to oil experts. The JASC oil terminal opened, officially opened a few years ago, but they're just now got a lot of more activity. And in this one, this post from Tommy Emmer, a GOP majority whip, Iran's illicit oil revenues swelled at 200 billion since Harris took office. This is critical from the standpoint, Michael, that when we talk about the Strait of Hormoz, the U.S. leaked plans of Israel attacking Iran's oil to Iran. Oops. Then they had Iran attack Netanyahu's house. I'm not sure what's going to happen, and I don't think he's going to tell the Biden administration again. So this having another port open for them to still export is either A, another target, Michael, or it's going to have another way for them to bypass a whole shipping area. It's pretty wild what's going on over there. Yeah, it is. I mean, it's extremely wild what's going on over there, and I don't think anybody really knows. We do know that it's... What we do know is this, the United States is complicit in the fact that we are allowing these oil exports to take place. And right, wrong, or indifferent, that's what we're doing. I'm not going to sit up here and say, well, we should be throwing sanctions on them. We know sanctions don't really work, so if you just let them do what they do, we can then track this stuff. Super, super interesting. Now, if they... If they go ahead and shut down the Strait of Hormuz and start using this other stuff, that's going to cause complete global turmoil when it comes to the overall pricing structure. Right. So do I think they're going to do that? No, I don't think they're going to do that. Now, if they did do that, I think that's an insane provocation. And they, I think they would only do that if they want to draw the U.S. closer into this conflict. Right now, I think they want to keep everybody at an arm's length and just fight right. Iran, Israel. They maybe feel like they have a little bit of an, and not an edge, but they feel like they're more level-headed yeah, that way know. or even that way. But if they go after the, the Strait of Hormuz, things will get spicy. I mean, last week, Michael, they had a B-2 do a bunker buster on the Houthis. They could have done that eight months ago and saved a bazillion gallons of diesel around the world transporting tankers all over the place. So the Biden administration is totally worthless when it comes to geopolitical solutions. It's it's just thought it's, I'd point that out. It's 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 <laughs> unbelievable. They're they're trying to figure out they're trying to figure out how to get about this. And if they can get around the Strait of Hormuz stuff, it's only going to help them continue to bring in money and, and fund all these proxy wars that's happening. Oh, yeah. I'm a, I'm a non-war kind of guy. I don't like war. No, we don't. Florida is the most gas-dependent state in the country. This one really kind of caught my attention. It was on LinkedIn. And a shout out to Jacob Williams on LinkedIn. I saw this on his posts. And when we take a look at natural gas... Natural gas, 40% of natural gas U.S. generation is, is the most used in the area. It looks like the chart is showing that 76% is very heavily weighted that it needs natural gas. Natural gas is greater than 50% of generation in the eastern of the U.S. and Gulf Coast and 45 in the southwest in California. California gas is a fundamental source for low cost and reliable power for most of the country. I couldn't agree more with that. And then you take a look at nuclear, nuclear in that same region is only 9% in the Texas area. And then you've got the Southeast area at 29%. But for the United States, 18% of our power comes from nuclear. And for, for us to have such a nuclear, to have such a black eye, could you imagine losing 18% of your ability to produce power? It would be nuts. 14% of the U.S. energy mix from wind and solar 
is pretty my, uh, mind blowing to me when you take a look at this chart. The chart is in the Midwest. You look at 24% of the energy mix in Texas, Arkansas, Oklahoma, Louisiana is from wind, solar. And that just to me is amazing. And you take a look at the Southeast, 4% in there. They really need that natural gas in there. So this article really is telling when you say, wait a minute, or is everybody using wind? Is everybody using it? No. I'll tell you what, but at what cost? We have spent trillions around the world trying to get to we renewable energy. And we all know that wind and solar is not truly renewable energy because it has to be constantly updated in order to, to maintain the fleet, the wind fleet. So it's pretty interesting there. Let's go to California's energy dilemma and how new laws might spark higher, even higher gas prices. The recent closure announcement of Phillips 66 refinery in Los Angeles is just one example of how stringent environmental regulations are driving refineries out of business. With strict rules can, on emissions, operating costs, many California-based refineries can't compete with their cheaper counterparts elsewhere, leading to dwindling number of domestic refining operations. The new law requires oil refineries to remain higher fuel inventories, plan for maintenance outages, and allow the state emergency commission to approve maintenance schedules. Oh, that's what we need. While intended to stabilize gas prices and prevent manipulation, critics argue this could lead to higher storage costs, operational, cons operational constraints. This is really important. California's reliance on foreign oil raises several concerns. I'm going to take it one step further. While China has been increasing their downstream uh, capabilities, they have been increasing their gasoline and diesel. I'm willing to bet and bookmark this that you'll be able to see China importing gasoline and diesel. Who's going to be making money on it? I want to follow the money. Is that money going to go back to Governor Newsom and his reelection campaign? We need to know because the, none of these decisions are made are good for Californians. They are absolutely not good for the environment by having to bring it all the way in. So China is importing in Iranian oil. It's coming in all the way from Iran. It goes to the refineries and then the gasoline is going to be shipped to California. That's good for the environment. Or remember, California is still buying 70% of the oil that is produced out of the rainforest. They're stripping the rainforest and they're bringing that oil into California from China. It's all public information. Kamala Harris, far left climate engagement director, accuses oil and gas workers of committing eco terrorism and weaponizing white supremacy and toxic psychiatry. Kamala Thorndike called fossil fuel industry a death cult that weaponized white supremacy. You can't buy this kind of hoo-ha, even if you went to the farm and shoveled it yourself. The Harris Waltz campaign climate engagement director has a long history of demonizing fossil fuels, going as far as accusing oil and gas workers of committing the eco-terrorism and advancing individual Ism, white supremacy, and toxic patriarchy, uh, Washington Free Beacon Review found. This is actually disgusting. And when you sit back and think, here's a quote out of the story. To have that level of money flowing so so few people, CEOs and shareholders, there's something evil about that. There's something that is a system that is so unequal and uncallous to human suffering, she said in her August 22 interview with the Climate Journey podcast. 
I would challenge anyone who's in the fossil fuel sector to consider putting their talents elsewhere else, because in my mind, there's no greater source of harm than continuing to cook the planet, which we've known for decades. My response to you is, if you would love to come on this podcast, let's talk facts. My challenge, Camelia, is if you would come on this podcast, let's talk about what facts are. The facts are, over the last several years, I've been documenting that that we will, the more we go to renewable wind and solar, which renewable is a funny term, we will use more fossil fuels because they are not sustainable, both in physics and fiscally responsible. You are more than welcome on this podcast at any time. I would love to talk to you about not necessarily white supremacy, because I believe your views are totally out to lunch, but I would love to know why you think a fiscally irresponsible plan of putting in wind and solar with our current grid situation and the current physics Why is it that whenever there are wind and solar countries like Germany, the UK, let's look at New York, New Jersey, California, all of them are failing financially because of the physics around the renewable wind and solar programs. It does not have anything to do with what you were talking about on this. Totally out to lunch. Interesting article. I got to hand it to Bill Ackman, who is a billionaire stepping out on Squawk Box. I do think MSNBC has one of the best shows on Squawk Box for news. Um, I'm not a particular fan of uh, one of the individuals there who, if you watch the entire video, I put the their X post in the article and you'll be able to watch and you'll figure out who I'm talking about there. But let's go through Bill's points. Bill has been in the history giving mostly to Democrats, but he said he can't really back Kamala Harris. And it's because of the 32 different things that the Biden Harris administration has done. And these are 33 gigantic reasons not to vote for Kamala Harris. Let me read you this line. While 33 actions I described below are the Democratic Party and the Biden-Harris administration, they are also the actions and policies that unfortunately our most aggressive adversaries would likely implement had they wanted to destroy America from within and had the ability to take control of our leadership. These are the 33. I'm not going to go through all 33, but I am going to go through a few of them here. This is very important. And again, uh, my hat's off to him, Bill. I know he probably lost a few uh, friends and maybe even a family member over coming out like this, but you are more than welcome to stop on the Energy Newsbeat podcast. I'd love to visit with you. And again, congratulations. I really loved your article. It, you had pinned it to your uh, ex, uh, your contact information or your ex post will be in the, the show notes. So let's start with number one, open the border to millions of immigrants who are not screened for their risk to the country, dumping them into communities where the new immigrants overwhelmingly existing communities and the infrastructure support the new entrants at the expense of historic residents. I'll tell you what, it's not that I'm against immigration. I am all for it legal immigration. And I believe that's what exactly what he was saying as well, too. The withdrawal from Afghanistan, we know how horrible that was. Introduce economic policies and massively increase spending without regard to their impact on inflation. And I'll tell you what, I I think the real eye-opener here is if Manchin had not stalled or halted some of this stuff, we could have seen even higher inflation on this. Introduce thousands and new unnecessary regulation in light of the existing regulatory regime that interfere with our businesses' ability to compete. Uh, We have, it has cost the U.S. consumers trillions, and we've talked about this before, promote DEI ideologies. 
limit or attempt to ban fracking and LNG so that U.S. energy increase substantially and U.S. is losing its energy independence. What this also has done is they have also weaponized the U.S. dollar through sanctions. And he goes on and talks about that, I believe, in one of these down here as well. And, and when you talk about take no serious actions when 45 American citizens are killed by terrorists and 12 are taken hostages. I'll tell you what, if President Trump was in, we would have had those hostages back already. I don't think we would have been waiting around for a year. Lie to the American people about the cognitive health of the president and accuse those who provide video evidence of his decline, sharing a doctored videos and being a right-wing conspirator. He nails it. I mean, uh, Kamala had to have hid that. Select the Democratic nominee for president in a backroom process by undisclosed party leaders, not allowing Americans to choose between candidates in an open primary. Holy smokes. Litigate it to make it illegal for states to require a proof of citizen, a citizenship, a voter ID, and, and resistance and reside in order to vote when a time when Americans have lost confidence in the accuracy and trustworthiness of our voting system. Holy smokes. Bill Ackman, my hat is off to you. And I would love to have you on the podcast and talk to you about your views and your impact. I'm hoping that you didn't lose too many friends. And and again, thank you very much.